verse of scripture from Romans chapter 3 and verse 25. A verse that we started last week, but we are going to advance one more word into it today. Read with me. Whom God set forth as a propitiation through faith in his blood. Repeat after me. Whom God set forth as a propitiation through faith in his blood. Let's bow our heads before the Lord one more time. Father, we thank you this morning. We came to understand your word because your word was designed for us to know you. We can only know you by what you tell us about yourself. We have a general idea who you are, but specific ideas only come through specific revelation by your specific word. Help us to understand it. Help us, Lord, to accept it and help us to apply it and help us to appreciate it today every soul needs you today in Christ's name amen please be seated <clears throat> I've never done that but I'm going to take my coat off <laughs> as we are continuing our study of this crucial and extremely important portion of the book of Romans we said that this portion Romans chapter 3 verse 21 to the end of chapter 3 is probably without exaggeration one of the most important portion of the entire Bible in it we are studying in detail what salvation through faith in Jesus Christ means. This is the heart of Christianity right here. And in it we learn, if you remember last week, this triangle. How many people remember the triangle? Raise your hand. Those who weren't here, I think you should listen to last week's sermon, but I'll summarize it to you. We learned about the three major doctrines that describe what salvation is. We learned about justification. And we said that justification, it says in Romans 3.24, being justified freely by His grace. We learned that justification is a declaration from the throne of God. God the judge sends a legal declaration declaring anyone who believes in Jesus Christ innocent, just, right with God by faith in Christ. It's a legal declaration justified freely by His grace to someone who doesn't deserve it. We, the sinners who broke the law of God, deserve the opposite. But because we have faith in Jesus Christ, God the Father declares as a judge a legal verdict. He says, you are innocent. You're not guilty. That's what justification is. Very important doctrine of that three-segment triangle of salvation. We learned also about redemption. Redemption. And again, redemption, he says it in verse 24, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And we said that redemption means to redeem something, to purchase someone from slavery, to pay a price, to set a prisoner free. That's what Jesus Christ did. He paid a very dear price in order to free me and you believers in him from the prison the prison of sin and the prison of Satan we were in bondage to sin and to Satan we had no freedom but Christ redeemed us he purchased us and he brought us out from that prison by his redemption we learned the third doctrine if you remember in the last few weeks of salvation, 
propitiation. That was last week. Verse 25 starts by saying, whom God set forth as a propitiation. And I explained what that means. I called it the forgotten doctrine. Because a lot of people know about justification and they know about, about, about redemption, but they forget propitiation. What does it mean? We said propitiation means to satisfy God's wrath against sin. God is angry with sin. And his anger, called the wrath of God, cannot be satisfied except cannot be propitiated unless someone pays for the sin. Sin has to be atoned for. It has to be paid for. And the only way to do it is either you die or you have a substitute die in your place. And that's what Jesus Christ did. Became our substitute to become the sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world by his death. We are now no longer the recipient of God's anger. God is no longer angry with me, the sinner, because Jesus Christ propitiated, he satisfied, he set aside the wrath of God against my sin. We learned all that, but the question remains, in what sense did Jesus accomplish this salvation? What is the main characteristic of this great salvation that was given to us through Jesus Christ? And it's summed up in that one word, what we're going to be studying today, a word that is probably the key point of the entire Bible. The word goes like this, whom God set forth as a propitiation through faith in his blood. I repeat, whom God has set as a propitiation, set forth as propitiation through faith in his blood. His blood. This is an extremely important word in the entire Bible. The blood. The blood of Jesus Christ. We believers in Jesus Christ, we are redeemed by the blood. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. When the Apostle Paul was saying farewell to the leaders of the church of Ephesus there in Miletus, he met them. He gave them warnings. He gave them advice. But he was mainly anxious, as it says in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. He was anxious that they should take heed of themselves and all the flock which God has, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd. And then he adds, the church of God whom he purchased, redeemed by his own blood. Isn't that a beautiful statement? God purchased the church, redeemed the church by his blood. There was blood. Redemption happened through the blood. And justification happened through the blood. It says in Romans 5, 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood. And now our verse tells us that propitiation also happened through the blood. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by faith in his blood. So today I'd like to speak to you about this very important term in the Bible, the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ. Bringing before you two important points about this extremely important word, the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ. The first point I'd like to bring before you today about this extremely important word in the Bible called the blood is that this word is the characteristic way in which the entire New Testament deals 
and describes our salvation. This is not just in the book of Romans. This is everywhere. Everywhere. From Old Testament to New Testament, the centerpiece, the characteristic of salvation is summed up in that one word, the blood. Their condition is broken. <laughs> but you can try. No, no, I see. The blood. We find it everywhere in the New Testament. We find it in the Old Testament, but we find it mainly in the New Testament. In Ephesians, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me or just listen. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, we read the following. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. You see, redemption happens through the blood. We are purchased, we are set free through the blood. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, after the apostle had told them <clears throat> that in the past you were Gentiles, uncircumcised, strangers to the kingdom of God, without hope, you were nothing, you were enemies of God. But he says in verse 13 of Ephesians chapter 2, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And he says in uh, Hebrews chapter 9, something we looked at last week, starting from verse 11, says, but Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. In the old days, the priests had to offer lambs. And in the Islam, in Islam, they still offer a lamb. They call the Adha, the sacrificial lamb. They have to offer lambs, goats, bulls. But it says that Jesus Christ did a lot more than that. This time he did not do a sacrifice that needs to be repeated. He did it once for all and forever by entering through his own blood. For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes and heifers sprinkling the unclean sacrifice for the purifying of the flesh, verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 9, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. In the old days, the high priest entered the Holy of Holies once a year by the blood of a lamb. But now Jesus Christ entered the eternal Holy of Holies, heaven's Holy of Holies, once for all, the veil was torn, and now we can follow in his steps into the very presence of God. And he says in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, again, through the blood. This is probably one of the greatest verses that explains how prayer can be heard. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness, listen to this, to enter the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus. That explains what, why we Christians, when we pray, we pray with assurance. We don't enter hesitantly into a prayer meeting because we enter by the blood of Christ. That's where assurance, that's the essence of why Prayer in the name of Jesus is the only prayer that will ever be answered. Because we're entering, having the blood of Christ as an entry point for us. And that blood is acceptable to God because the blood of the most innocent, the most perfect human being that ever lived on earth as a man. God himself who became a man, shed his blood 
and he became an entry point to all those who believe in him into the presence of God. And, and I'll take you another verse in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18 and 19. It says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Brothers and sisters, I'm reading to you and I'm going to read maybe a couple more verses. I want to tell you that the blood is the centerpiece of our salvation, of our communion, of our relation with God. And it says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And listen to this. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. There's something that cleans our sins. It's called what? The blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. And then I read one more verse in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. It says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us, washed us from our sins in his own blood. Do you understand the essence? How important is that word? In the Bible, it is the main characteristic by which all the writers of the Bible characterize our salvation. It is by the blood, through the blood, in the blood of Jesus Christ. We need to appreciate that and we need to hang on to it and we need to teach more about it and we need to know about it. And now our verse comes, it says in Romans 3, 5, 325 it says, Whom God set forth as a propitiation by faith in his blood. You see, it's all through the blood. The characteristic, the essence of it all is the blood of Jesus Christ. We need to understand that this is the only way we can understand Christianity. And the question, why? Why the blood? Why? How come there has to be blood? I think this is important to understand. Why is it that the New Testament doesn't speak just about the death of Jesus? Isn't that enough? It's not enough. There has to be blood. There has to be blood. And this will be the second point of my sermon to you today. The blood is the essence, but why? Why is it that the blood is the essence? I'd like to tell you today that the term blood is used rather than death in order to bring this teaching about how the Lord saves us in line with all the teaching of the Old Testament about the sacrificial killing that had to be done. In the Old Testament, there were sacrificial laws that were designed by God. Anytime anybody sins, he had to offer a sacrificial animal. And now comes the New Testament and it wants to make sure that this stays in line with the teaching of the Old Testament. If you remember a few weeks ago, we took Romans 3.21 and it says the following, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And we said that our interpretation of the New Testament must never contradict the Old Testament. The Old Testament and the New Testament are one book. If there is contradiction, it's wrong. They're the same. It's the same book. We don't divide and say we're done with the Old Testament. The New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So the use of the blood is to remind us that the teaching about salvation in the Old Testament is in line with what Jesus had done in the New Testament. 
the description of our salvation in the New Testament is in line with the teaching of the Old Testament. It is the same. It's the same author. God wrote one book. And he spoke about one salvation. The New Testament teaching about the blood of Jesus is always in line with the Old Testament sacrificial offerings. This is how John the Baptist, remember, John the Baptist was the last prophet of the Old Testament ushering the New Testament. Do you remember when John the Baptist saw Jesus Christ, what he called him? He says in John chapter 1 and verse 29, Behold, what? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look at the Lamb, the sacrificial Lamb who came to be sacrificed in order to take away the sin of the world. John the Baptist announced that what was taught in the Old Testament is going to be happening now. It's going to be fulfilled now in Jesus Christ. Amen. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the Lord Jesus himself confirmed that about himself also. He says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, he said, I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets. I came not to destroy but to fulfill not one jot or tittle shall be shall be shall pass from the law until all is fulfilled christ came to fulfill entirely all the teachings of the old testaments that were types about him christ in a sense is the great anti-type of all the types that were described in the old testament in Matthew 20, 28, he says, The Son of Man did not come to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom, a ransom for all. Christ came to be the sacrificial lamb, the ransom to redeem us from the slavery of sin and Satan. To the two disciples who were on their way to Emmaus, do you remember? They were discouraged. They were kind of depressed because he had just died. And he appeared to them on that road to Emmaus in Luke 24, verse 44 and 45. And he took them through the law. He took them through the prophets. And he took them through the book of Psalms. He said, I want to take you over all the Old Testament. And then he showed them that all things must be fulfilled. It has to happen. Whatever was written in the law of Moses, whatever the prophet said, whatever the book of Psalms said concerning me, that is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. He said to them, this was written. I had to come to die and then to rise from the dead. I came to fulfill that. Don't be discouraged. This is part of the plan. And there is a beautiful verse in the letter of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. It says, For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Can you believe it? It spells it out. Christ is what? The Passover lamb. Remember the Passover? Remember when the Israelites were to come out from Egypt? They could only come out because they were spared because of the blood of that lamb that was put, painted on the doors of their houses. And the angel of the Lord came and he said, when I see the blood, I shall what? Passover. Christ, our Passover by his blood, he will preserve me from being destroyed by the wrath of God. This is the typical characteristic Old Testament sacrificial teaching. And if we are to understand the meaning of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have to approach it in this way by his blood. The Old Testament sacrificial system was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. I say that because unfortunately 
not outside Christianity, but inside Christianity, there is controversy about that today. I'm telling you this. If you're not a Christian, don't be discouraged about that because I want to tell you, if there is one characteristic Satan would like to hide from the eyes of people, it is the blood of Jesus Christ. So now, we have some churches that don't want to speak about the blood. They say this is too gross. Let's avoid it. Let's just talk about the death of Christ. Let's just talk about the cross. Let's leave the blood aside. Some of them go even one step further. They speak about it with scorn. They speak about it with, with sarcasm. They speak about it with blasphemy. They said the blood is nothing but paganism. What do you mean? Somebody killed and spilling his blood? Let's leave that aside. Let's talk about the love of God. That's all. That's enough. They even say that this has nothing to do with Christianity. They say it's all Judaism and it should be just removed because we're done with the Old Testament. But I tell you from this pulpit, they're wrong. We're not done with the Old Testament. We're seeing the fulfillment of the Old Testament. The only thing I can say about people who don't want to look up to the blood of Jesus, I say they're not Christians at all. Because the essence of Christianity, the characteristic of salvation is summed up in that one word, the blood of Jesus Christ. Blood means sacrificial death. It was described in the Old Testament through the sacrificial death of animals. And it was fulfilled in the New Testament by the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for our sins. We need to teach more about it. We need to sing more about it. Worship team, let us sing more hymns about the blood of Jesus Christ. Hymns like Robert Lowry's old hymn. I love that hymn. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Or William Cowper's beautiful old hymn. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. I love those hymns. I think we need to come back and proclaim from our pulpits the importance, the essence, the characteristic of true salvation. It is by the blood of Jesus. I want to tell you today that unless you're washed by faith, by the blood of Jesus, the wrath of God against your sins remains on you. No one will ever enter heaven, paradise. No one. No matter what he or she does. No one will ever enter unless they're washed by faith in the blood of Jesus. And this blood of Jesus Christ fulfilled all the teachings of those sacrificial death of the animals in the Old Testament. What did those sacrificial death of animals in the Old Testament teach us? They taught us several principles. To begin with, they taught us the principle that they were designed as a propitiation of God. It was like appeasing God's anger. It never says in the Old Testament that offering the animals was to help the person who's, being, who's doing the offering. It is to appease God. It's like, here, uh, here's some blood for my sin so that you are satisfied, Lord. And then they taught us that that propitiation was secured by the expiation, the removal or the canceling of the guilt of the sinner. The sin is now canceled. And me, the sinner, who believed in that offering, now I can come into the presence of God. They taught us also that the propitiation was done by punishment of an innocent victim. 
An innocent victim had to die. The sinner will take a lamb or a goat or a bull, depending on the magnitude of his or her sin. He lays hands on that animal, transferring his sins to the animal, and then the animal had to be what? Killed, and his blood had to be shed. The animal was sacrificially killed. The animal bears the punishment. The sinner substitute the animal for himself. This is a very important doctrine. Substitution. And you cannot begin to understand the Old Testament teaching in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, unless you grasp this principle. Punishment of a victim which is substituted for the offender and by the offender. Me, the offender, will bring a victim, an innocent victim, and say, let this victim die in my place. The effect of sacrificial offering was the pardon of the offender and his restoration into the favor and the fellowship of God. These are, these are very important principles we need to grasp in order to understand why there has to be blood. And notice that blood always had to be produced. It wasn't sufficient that the animal would be killed. That wasn't enough. He had to be bled and his blood was used to sprinkle the entry to the Holy of Holies. There had to be blood. Still, someone might ask, why blood? I know some people might ask you this. How come blood? I mean, why didn't God do it just less bloody? Less, less messy? I want to tell you why. It is answered to us in that wonderful verse in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 because it says without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. Without blood there is no remission of sin. Because God from the beginning had ordained that the sinner must die. He told it to Adam in the garden of Eden. Before the fall, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, he said, Adam, listen to me. The day you eat from it, this fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the day you eat from it, death you will die. God has decreed that sin must, be, must produce death. And the sinner must die. And the decree continues. It's not going to change. The sinner must die. And there's no remission of sins apart from the shedding of blood. You see how consistent the Bible is? The Bible from the beginning to the end is the same principle. Sin must produce death. And there's no remission of sin except through the blood. There has to be death. And this is what the Lord Jesus did himself. He tells us, that all these prophecies in the Old Testament were about him. All these sacrificial animals were prophecies, were types about him, the antitype. He fulfilled all of them. So we are now in a position, therefore, to say what this teaching is concerning the blood of Christ. It means that Christ became our substitute, shedding his blood for us, the sinners. In the Old Testament, the offender will bring himself the animal. He will go and buy the lamb and bring it and offer it. But now, something greater happened. Now, it's no longer us bringing the animal. We're no longer us bringing the offering. It is God himself who gives us the offering, his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the greatness of the gospel, that I'm no longer bringing an offering. God is providing the offering. Amen. And his offering is a, in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives it himself. And he's killed, and his, his blood is shed. And by faith in that blood... There is remission of my sin. 
in the old days, the offering of animals will give remission of sin temporarily, just for a short while. But now, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us eternally from all sin. What does it mean? It means that Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, he bore all the penalty of all our sins. Isaiah 53 verse 6, it says, God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, the whole Bible is concocted on this. God took Jesus Christ and he said, you're going to be now the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. On him was placed all the penalty of our sins. And Peter repeating that in his first book, chapter 2 and verse 24, he says, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes, indicating the blood, stripes produce blood, by whose stripes we are healed. God says, I say it prophetically, I'm looking forward for a day when I'm going to take someone who is a perfect substitute for the sin of the world, and I'm going to put him on that cross, and I'm going to lay on him all the penalty of the sins of the world. That means not only have the sins been laid upon him, but upon Jesus Christ was laid the very wrath of God. Jesus Christ did not just suffer for the sins. He suffered taking the brunt of God's wrath against sin. That's why he was so much struggling in Gethsemane. People say, why, why did Jesus so much in Gethsemane? Was he afraid when he said, Father, if it is at all possible, let this cup pass by me. How come? After all, he's brave. He's the son of God. I want to tell you why he was hesitant there. I want to tell you why he realized the brunt of what he's going to be taking, not only paying for sins, but he was going to take the brunt of the wrath of God instead of you and me. That's why he cried out in Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken, forsaken me? It was God's wrath that was poured out in all its anger and all its ferocity on his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Martyrs go to their death sometimes without even thinking twice about it. But Jesus was not just paying for sins. He was experiencing the great wrath of God the Father being poured on him. You see, take the scriptures word by word and they all fit together. No wonder. No wonder Satan always tries to come with thoughts to our dear friends, the Muslim. He tells them that this Bible was corrupted. Where was it corrupted? How could it be corrupted? We have more Greek, let alone from all other translations in other languages. We have more Greek original manuscripts of the Bible than any book that was ever written. I want to tell you, God made sure that this Bible will never be changed. It cannot be changed. And if God cannot uphold his Bible, what kind of God is he? No, he upheld his Bible. This Bible is for sure. And it speaks about God's way of dealing with sin. And he says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. This was not an option that Jesus Christ came just to show us how great he is. Had he done that, he would have done us no good. This was not just a prophet that came. Came from heaven, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world by his blood. The death of Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of the entire Bible. Remove that and you have, you have, you have nothing left in the Bible. That's why Satan is so, so active of covering that part of the Bible, the death 
and the sacrificial offering of Jesus Christ shedding his blood. Satan would like us to take, uh, he teaches many religions, say, Jesus Christ was a nice man, thus prophet, is a good man, we like him. That doesn't do you any good. Because if Jesus Christ did not shed his blood, you cannot be saved. This is the only way to enter into the presence of God. This is the only way we're justified by his grace freely. This is the only way we can have communion with God. This is the only way we can enter into the throne of God with boldness because of his blood. Remove the blood, you have nothing to do with God. You cannot enter into the presence of God. You cannot have communion with God, let alone ever dream of spending eternity with God. The blood is the essence of salvation. And you say to me, what about when we falter? Because we all falter. I don't want you to raise your hand. How many of you say, I faltered? Sometimes I trip. Sometimes I slip. Still the blood is what keeps us going. It's the blood that cleanses us. 1 John 2, 1, it says, If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for our ours only, but also for the sins of the whole, whole world by his blood. The blood that cleanses us once, cleanses us again and again and again once we have faith in that blood. Who am I? Who am I as a Christian? What's the definition of a Christian? I want to tell you what the definition of a Christian is. The definition of a Christian is, not, is that he is a child of a new covenant by the blood of Jesus Christ. I am a child of God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. I have faith that this blood was the blood of a substitute who took my place and paid for my sins. Amen. That's what a Christian is. That's who we are. He told us, he, he told them, he said, this cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. In my blood. When we break bread, we're reminded this is through the blood. We hold that cup and we say, it's because of that blood. I can come in communion with God because of that blood. I'm saved because of that blood. I can continue being saved because of that blood. We're covered by the blood. Everything is covered by the blood. And so we belong to the new covenant and we can read the will of Christ. You know what a covenant is? You know what a covenant is? like your will, the will of God. Uh, you know, some of you may have made your will, you know, and it's only given to those that you allow them to read it. So uh, after you die, and I hope we will all last a long time, but one day we will, your will will be open, and those whom you've designed as your, your heirs will read the will. We are the heirs through Christ. And now that we're covered by the blood, we can read that will, and we can appropriate everything that he has left us as a rich inheritance. That's why I think we need to sing more about the blood. It happens all by the blood. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. We need to speak about it. We need to praise God for it. And we need to, 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 to teach about it. Never be ashamed. Never be intimidated. Oh, you want to talk about the blood? Absolutely we want to talk about the blood. We believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. That it is the only mean of salvation and of communion and fellowship with God. Is this true about everybody? Does this blood cleanse everybody? No, it doesn't. It's only true about those who believe, those who have faith. Not everybody goes to heaven. Not everybody is saved. Only those who believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. There is None righteous, says the Bible, no, not one. It is those who f suddenly believe that what is being said in the Bible in the first portion of Romans is about me. I'm no good. No matter how much money I give to the poor, I'm no good. No matter how much religion I will follow, I'm still no good. No matter what I accomplish in my life, I'm still no good. None righteous, not even one. But I come now by faith that the blood of Jesus Christ, the substitute who took my place, can cover all my sins. 
and I receive this salvation freely through Him by faith. By faith. I'd like to end by telling you what true faith is. True faith is made of three elements. First element is knowledge. Second element is moving the heart. And the third element is commitment. Let me describe it to you in another picture. It's the story of a man and a woman who meet and eventually get married. First, he meets her, she meets him. They try to know about each other, right? This is the courting period. Tell me about your family. Tell me about your habits. I want to know if this girl is fit for me and she wants to know if you're fit for her. And after this knowledge portion comes a moving of the heart. Love develops. They become attached to one another. And once they've gone through that period of love, intimate, knowing, and the heart has been moved by emotions, then they say, you know what? I think it's time we should make this legal. And they go and sign a document and they repeat those vows before a minister. And I know some of you remember those vows that you made when you got married. And you have to repeat them after the minister that this is before those witnesses from here on. I am committed to that person for the rest of my life. That's what faith is all about. First you know about Jesus, but that doesn't save you alone. The Bible says that, say, that demons know about Jesus. That the demons believe that there's a God and they tremble. That doesn't save anybody yet. And then you say, but I've been kind of little, became emotional when they speak about Jesus. I have tears in my eyes. That's good, but that still doesn't save you. Even by appropriating this person. But now you need to make a commitment. A commitment. I love that hymn, that old hymn, I have decided. I've made a commitment to follow Jesus from this day on. So I'd like to invite you today, if you have not made that commitment, a lot of people don't know the date of their salvation. I ask people, when did you get saved? Uh, I'm not sure. What do you mean you're not sure? Then I ask them, when were you born? Oh, they know that day. They know their birthday, the first birthday. They know it by heart. They like to receive gifts and, and, and calls during that birthday. But how about your second birthday? When were you saved? When did you make the commitment? When did you sign the document that you belong to Jesus? So I'd like to invite you today, if you're not sure about the date of your salvation, let this day be the day. Let this day be the day. Let this day be the day when you finally take that document and say, here, I'm going to sign this document. I belong to Jesus Christ and I am saved by faith in his blood that was shed for me in the year 30 AD on a hill called Calvary. There died the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and I believe that his blood can cover my sins. And today I want to commit to follow him. To believe in him. You say to me, but my faith is so weak. I want to tell you. I like what Spurgeon once said. He said, even a trembling hand can receive a golden gift. I want you to extend that trembling hand of yours. I don't care how little your faith is. Come, put it in the hands of Jesus, which was pierced and which is bleeding for your sins. And tell him, Lord Jesus, with my little faith, I come to you today to grab on to you so that your blood will cover all my sins. Let's bow our head before the Lord. Whom God set forth as a propitiation through faith in his blood. Have you made a commitment to him? I invite anybody who hasn't made that commitment. You don't know the date of your salvation. You're not sure when you got saved. You think you're saved, but you're not certain. Let this day be the day where you are certain and you say, today I want to make a commitment. 
commitment that I belong to Jesus Christ and that I believe that faith in his blood saves me and I want to belong to him through that blood. I'd like to give an opportunity to anybody who says, I'd like to make that commitment today. Just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Amen. 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 Let's all stand up and close in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you that this morning you brought us to the essence, the characteristic, the main characteristic of true salvation. How we are redeemed, how we are justified, how your wrath is propitiated. It is through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. So we want to sing about that blood. We want to teach about the blood. We want to preach about the blood. We want to tell the world that there is a lamb that came from heaven. And he's called the Lamb of God. And by his blood, by his sacrificial death, he brings the remission and the removal of the sin of anyone who believes in him. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. As we continue our teaching about the rest of that Romans, help us to see the benefits. Salvation is only one. But there are many other benefits from the blood of Jesus Christ. We give him all glory. We give you all glory. We thank you for that you did not spare your only son. But you gave him up to experience your wrath. So that we can be spared that wrath. Thank you Father. I pray for every person who raised their hand. That they will be given by your Holy Spirit assurance that you have received them as children of yours from this day on and all they have to do is now grow by reading your Bible and by adhering to meetings and by by commun communing and fellowship with other Christians that they may grow in the faith that was handed to them right now today in Christ's name we pray amen amen, amen. God bless you all